who want to know who I have here? It's me, Tortuga, Agosto. Te amo, Agosto. I thought I had to bring in a little bit of emotional support today. Why? Because this is our last AP Live session. I'm Margaret Evans, once again, bringing you AP Live for our last session. And I am so, so glad you decided to hang in there with me and Mr. Monsoor rocking the AP Live content. Augusto is glad you're here as well. So let's go ahead and jump in and get started as we hit our last major unit, which is Unit 8, Ecology. All righty, here we go. So what will we learn in our last session of AP Live? Ah, let's do this and let's go out with a bang. So we're going to be hitting a couple of different topics here, uh, looking at 8.1 through 8.5, environment, energy flow. I know that I'm full of energy today. Can you see it flowing? Can you see it flowing? It's flowing. So we got to pull, our, pull it home with our energy flow here, population ecology, effective density on populations, and community ecology. Now, I know you guys have been loving the fact that you could hit us up on the tiny URL for feedback and get some shout outs and let us know how we're doing. And even though this is our last AP Live session and I won't be able to come back another time and give any more shout outs, please, 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 we still want to hear from you. So as long as they're leaving the feedback form open, jump in there, let Mr. Monsoor and, uh, and myself know how we've been doing and how we've been helping you guys because you guys have been helping us. This is definitely a team effort and we appreciate all the great feedback and we appreciate you being there with us for these last two weeks of sessions. And remember that QR code? It's there, so go ahead and use that as a way to access that form. All righty, so addressing our last bit of feedback, here that's just pointing you to those codes again. These are some previous questions that were asked yesterday of Mr. Mansoor as he wrapped up Unit 7. Do cladograms just show evolutionary relatedness or do they show the relative timing of divergences? And that's an awesome question and it actually kind of ties into question number two. So it looks like we had some students that were on the same mindset, sending those neurons and we're connecting here. So there is a difference between a phylogenetic tree and a cladogram and it does have to do with the timing. So I'm going to try to hit both of those questions at the same time. So when you're looking at a cladogram, a cladogram is just simply trying to show you hypothetical relationships between organisms based on some data we've collected. It might have been molecular data, might have been structural data, but based on the data we have, where are the common ancestors? Who do we think diverged from whom? But the cladogram actually does not show timing. So that's the reason why when you look at a cladogram, all of the organisms wind up being at the same level. All of them have kind of like the same spacing in between each of the lines because we're really not trying to indicate timing. Uh, relative history of timing of divergences. We're just looking at, we think that these two diverged. We think that this one diverged here. We think that this one diverged there. And there's really no historical timing that's related to that. Whereas a phylogenetic tree, now we're looking at potential timing um, and we're looking at lengths of the, uh, the lines on the tree. If we have a line that stops a little bit shorter than the other ones, that could indicate um, extinction on the tree. Um, certain lines might be longer than others. So if you trace the phylogenetic tree back down to the base, clearly if it's a big long line all the way back down to the base of the tree, then that means we believe that there's very little um, evolutionary changes that have occurred over time in that organism versus an organism who might have a shorter branch on the tree, we suspect that there has been uh, more uh, changes that have occurred within that line of ancestry. So once again, phylogenetic trees dealing with uh, timing there, Length of tree, length of lines, length of, of branches are helping you get some perspective of the relative time of divergences, whereas cladograms are like hypothetical. 
really not uh, specifying any any uh, time, but taking a look at who do we think is more closely related to whom based on their position within the cladogram. And lastly, do we need to know plant and animal form and function for the AP test? Not really. I mean, obviously we can use form and function as a way to convey information. We can throw it into a, a stimulus question to get you thinking about how structure is related to function but any specific animal forms or plant forms are really not a part of the overall course and exam description. So we might talk about the, the purpose of a leaf, we might talk about the pur purpose of antenna, uh, but whether or not there are specific structures you have to know um, within the plant kingdom or animal kingdom, not necessarily beyond what's already presented in your course and exam description. So awesome questions. You guys have been awesome. Hopefully that helps. So let's jump into some ecology for today. So let's review. Taking a look at 8.1 first, we're going to be looking at changes in the environment. The environment is not the same. You know, if you've been living in your environment for a while, you can see changes happening from year after year. And this year, oh, we're supposed to have it. I know in the, uh, the eastern region, we're supposed to have our big explosion of cicadas that are coming out this year. So that's definitely going to be a change in the environment compared to other years. But environments change. Uh, organisms within the environment, not only do they communicate with each other in the same species, but we as organisms in our environment are constantly interacting with other species, interacting with our abiotic factors. All of that together is determining the awesome dynamic nature of an environment and its community. And we're going to be taking a look at some of those examples. So first of all, making sure we understand that animals do have an ability to communicate and with each other in the same population, with other species of animals, and we use certain communication mechanisms like visual cues. Uh-oh, did you move? Did you duck? You know, what does that mean? If you know anything about meerkats, when they put their heads up and start looking around, that's because they're wondering if there's predators coming, is there danger in the environment? touching and feeling those animals that have little antenna, they're feeling their environment, collecting data, hormones and signals can be sent out when animals are marking trees or, or when your cat rubs up against your uh, hand or your body, they're, they're actually sharing their chemicals with you. That's a one way of marking you. So chemicals can be used um, and different communication mechanisms can be used. And this helps with knowing where food is, if I'm putting out a call, Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. That might mean danger, or it might be come this way because I just found some awesome deliciousness. And so animals have ways of, res of responding to the environment and communicating with one another. Let's take a look at another example here. Um, we have, we talked about natural selection and we talked about how natural selection will favor behaviors that animals have that will increase their ability to survive and remember, there's another component to that. You got to be reproductively successful. So there are innate behaviors. And what we mean by innate, uh, those would be like the things that are like genetically controlled that you don't have to learn. So if I put my hand on a hot stove, I don't have to learn to snatch my hand away. That is, you know, that's like a, a reaction to that. So there are innate behaviors that are genetically controlled. And that are there, there are things that are learned, like, you know, an animal bringing along its little young so that it can learn how to find food or, or uh, learn how to hide from predators. And so these types of behaviors are also subject to natural selection, because if they increase the chance of the organism's survival, um, then it can be, those behaviors can be selected. Um, and understanding that Organisms cooperate with one another. Not only do we have cooperation within the same species, but we also have cooperation with uh, between different species. So that's the difference between intra species uh, 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 intra species cooperation within the same species and inter species cooperation, which is between different species. 
Okay, let's go ahead and look at another example here. I'm sure you guys have learned that there's things called stimuli, and these would be uh, anything in the environment that causes a response. So here we have uh, the moths that are flying towards the light. The light attracts moths. Um, and so any type of response, you know, moving away from a stimulus, moving towards a stimulus. So the environment has all these different stimuli. Some of them are biotic stimuli, meaning the presence of another organism might cause an, an, an organism to respond to that. Or some of it can be abiotic stimuli, like in this case, the light is drawing the moths. So the key here is organisms respond to their environments, which is pretty awesome. In addition to that, we can exchange information with one another. Here's our cute little birds. They might be talking to each other and they might be sharing information um, about different things. It might be time for mating. It might be, you know, hi, I'm a baby bird, mom. I need you to help me finding some food. So there are different ways that we can communicate with one another and signal um, to our organisms within our same population. Some misconceptions. One of the misconceptions as it relates to just response and environment and fitness and natural selection is that fitness only includes survival. Remember, we've talked about that in chapter seven. Not only do you have to survive, but you have to survive long enough to reproduce and pass on any of that good genetic information. Um, there are some students that believe that behaviors are not genetically controlled. And there are definitely a host of behaviors that are genetically controlled. That's when we're talking about those innate behaviors. And also there's a misconception that communication between organisms is only through done through external cues, but there are internal cues that we can use as well, um, things that happen inside of our bodies in order to um, communicate um, with one another. So just a couple of misconceptions to keep in mind, and let's go ahead and move to our next topic. Um, and we're going to take a look at some practice here. So 8.1 is skill, and we're going to be identifying experimental procedures. Now, I know when you first see this, you're like, whoa, how about all those words in this question? And yes, you may be hit with some uh, free response questions. Uh, more of the feedback was, hey, can we do some more free response? Well, here you have it. I'm going to try to do some more free response for you guys. So here's a big pretty intimidating question. And if you're doing this at home, pause it, kind of read through it. But I also tell students, sometimes when you're pressed for time, the best thing to do is read the question first. What are you being asked to find? And then work backwards. So for this kind of question, I might just want to read what they're going to ask me to do here. What is my task? And so if I read the task all the way at the bottom, it says, based on the information, identify one IV, one DV, and one negative control. So now that I already have that in my mind, now it should make it a little bit easier to kind of fish my way through all of this information to figure out what I'm looking for. So once again, if you're uh, watching this on demand, pause it, read through it. Once again, we're looking for IV, DV, and negative control. So I'm just going to go ahead and give us, since we're live, give, give us the answer here. So if you worked your way through that problem, the IV, there actually are a couple of IVs. And this is really interesting because I know um, sometimes, you know, in some of our early science classes, they tell you, you can only change one thing at a time. How many of us have heard that? You can only have one independent variable. But that's not necessarily true, depending upon what you're investigating. So in this particular question, there are actually a couple different independent variables. The song that's being recorded, uh, whether or not when we say model, we're not talking about Tyra Banks here, we're talking about the actual bird model that they are uh, putting into the environment and the combinations of song and model um, could be used as an independent variable. So we have more than one independent variable here. Dependent variable, what are we measuring? So what are we measuring here? We're measuring the aggression score of these flycatchers. How aggressive will they be when other birds are in their territory um, and looking at their behavioral response? Okay, so IV, what are we changing? Sometimes we could be changing more than one thing. DV, what are we measuring? And then our negative control is how does a particular subject, um, per, uh, how does a particular subject uh, 
perform or behave normally without other influences. So in reading through that question, you'll notice that they're talking about a golden whistler bird um, that's gonna be introduced to the fly catchers. So before we start looking at how these birds kind of change their behavior when they're introduced to each other, maybe we need to um, get some information about how they behave when the other bird is not present. So if we take the fly catcher away, then in the negative control, we're just looking at measuring the behavior of the golden whistler without the fly catcher being present there. So we just want to get some baseline data, some baseline data on how that bird behaves, performs, um, acts in its environment, without the other bird present. And so that would be our negative control for this particular experiment. Okay, so hopefully that helped. And on your AP exam, you'll be asked to pull out some of those good experimental um, components like uh, your negative control, positive control, IV, DV, maybe what are some of the controlled variables, et cetera. So let's move on to our next topic, 8.2. Oh, the wonderful energy flow through the ecosystems. Can we do it again? Energy flow, energy flow. And we're looking at here our, our famous food webs and food chains and how is um, energy passed throughout the, uh, the community, um, some different strategies of metabolism and regulation of energy in our environment. Because remember that organisms need a constant supply of energy. Energy drives uh, the entire ecosystem. And we're going to take a look at that through these examples here. Okay, so first of all, looking at metabolic rate. So there is a relationship between metabolic rate and body mass and the size of the organism. And generally, the smaller the organism, the actual, the higher the metabolic rate. And when we're talking about metabolic rate, we're talking about the amount of energy that's expended by the animal over a particular amount of time. How much energy is processed, released, by the organism in a particular window of time. And actually smaller organisms, they expend more energy, they break down chemicals, they uh, do that at a whole lot faster rate. Think about the hummingbird and how much energy has to be processed, expended for that hummingbird to flap its wings as fast as it does. Um, and so the smaller organisms have generally tend to have higher metabolic rates than larger organisms. Also, there's what's called different um, reproductive strategies. And I'm sure you, some of your teachers might have been talking about K strategists and R strategists as it relates to reproductive differences. And so some species will produce a whole lot of offspring at one time, like your rabbits and your mice. Um, that's less energy efficient because they got to spend all this energy producing all these offspring. However, it winds up being beneficial in an unstable environment where there's a tendency for a lot of your offspring to not make it. So investing all of this energy in order to make a whole lot of offspring at one time actually could benefit your population if the population is very unstable. Um, then you have some species like the elephant that's pregnant for almost two years or a long time, um, and they uh, have very slow reproduction, more energy and efficient, can invest all that energy in, you know, making sure that one offspring is developed and, and produced. But you don't see that kind of thing um, in environments that are unstable. That's usually for our ecologically stable environments where you have these, you know, long reproductive cycles within organisms. So A here, just remember metabolic rate, how quickly do you process and expend energy? Generally higher in smaller organisms and that there are different reproductive strategies that uh, utilize energy depending upon stability, the correlation between stability of the environment and the actual reproductive um, mechanisms. All right, let's look at another example. There's our infamous, or better yet, famous, not infamous. We love our food chains and our food webs, but here are our food chains and our food webs. And just making sure you understand that energy, chemical energy is passed from one organism to the next through a food chain. We have our autotrophs, we have our heterotrophs, we have our decomposers. All of those are part of the food chain. And remember the ultimate energy, the ultimate energy energy that's coming in that um, is used to maintain environments comes from the sun 
and those producers capture that energy, turn it into chemical energy, and then that's passed through the food chain, right? Right, Augusto? Food chain, yes. And so um, taking a look at a food chain just is showing you one specific route of energy transfer. But when you look at a food web, we understand that in a natural environment, there's not just one specific feeding relationship. We have a whole lot of different feeding relationships that are integrated, more than one autotroph, more than one tertiary consumer or primary consumer. So just remember here, that the organisms that are eating the producers are our primary consumers. Then we go from there to our secondary consumers, our tertiary consumers, et cetera. Decomposers, why are the decomposers usually not shown? Because decomposers tend to be able to operate on different trophic levels, not trophic level number one. Remember that's reserved for the autotrophs, but your decomposers, when organisms die, they can be operating on different trophic levels. So oftentimes food webs and food chains may not, may not, include the decomposers, but do remember that they are important. And lastly, the 10% rule. When an organism consumes another organism, only 10% of that energy is made available to the next organism. So hypothetically, if we have a plant that is generating 100 units of chemical energy and a rabbit eats that plant, then only 10% of that energy will be transferred to the rabbit. Why? Because the energy is going to be used by the plant. It's not like the plants are like, hey, I'm making all this energy for everybody else. I'm making this energy for me. So I'm going to use this energy for my own metabolic needs. And then remember during metabolism, a lot of that energy is lost as heat which is not available for use by the organisms. So a lot of that energy does not get passed on to the next organism. They only get 10% of that. That's a bummer. However, if you eat enough, get access to enough of that food energy, you'll be okay. And then remember, if something eats the rabbit, then that is only getting 10% of the 10%. So each time you go a next step in that food chain, the trophic level, you got to keep on chopping that down and only transferring 10% as you keep moving through those uh, trophic levels. Okay, so hopefully that was a good little review of our food chains and our food webs. And let's go ahead and look at another example. So endotherms and ectotherms, we hear about how there are some organisms that are warm blooded and some organisms that are cold blooded. And so what that's referring to is how they're using their thermal energy. And so uh, remember that when all these good metabolic activities are happening, a lot of that is released as heat. Woo, Ms. Evans is hot. And we're gonna be releasing that heat through our metabolic activities. And is that heat being used to regulate our body temperature? Okay, so if that metabolic, the generation of that metabolic heat uh, is going to be used to regulate your body temperature, we call you an endotherm, a warm blooded organism. However, if you have to rely on external mechanisms to maintain your body temperature and regulate that, we call you cold blooded, which is an ectotherm like my buddy here. Oh, I got to bring him again for his cameo, Augusto, cold blooded. So therefore, they are regulating their temperature by their external environment. So you'll see turtles in a pond or a lake up on a rock or a branch sunning themselves or an alligator who comes out of the water to get some sun because they're using external means to regulate their body temperature. So energy flows through the environment, not just for the purpose of facilitating reactions, but also thermal energy can be used to maintain body temperature. Some misconceptions, once again, we've already talked about that. One of the misconceptions is that larger organisms have a higher metabolic rate. It's flip, flip that around. It's smaller organisms that have a higher metabolic rate. Um, some people think that uh, autotrophs only use photosynthesis, but shh, don't tell anybody, there is something called chemosynthesis. And so there are some autotrophs that use chemosynthesis, like in the deep, 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 dark oceans where there is no sunlight. How do we have organisms down there? Somebody's got to be producing food. So we got these chemosynthetic organisms down there that are generating food from inorganic compounds. And so they are still, they are still considered autotrophs and they're a base of the food chain. Um, some people believe, some students believe that heterotrophs gain their energy just from eating. And yes, 
consumers are called consumers because they eat. But don't forget about the decomposers. They're not like cramming burgers in their mouths. They're actually absorbing the energy from the organism that they're living on, like the mold on a piece of fruit or a fungus growing on the side of a tree. They're absorbing energy, nutrients from that source. Um, and they are heterotrophs because they're getting their food energy from another source, but just not through eating or consumption. And that food is the only, only source of energy for organisms. Remember, we have our autotrophs. They also use light energy. And remember, we talked about using thermal energy. So there's all sorts of energy in the environment and uh, different forms of energy can be accessed and utilized by organisms in different ways. All right, let's practice the skill for 8.2 and it's explaining. So I'm not going to read this to you guys, but I'll give you a summary. So basically this question here uh, is dealing with the idea that we have a temperature change and we're looking at how much carbon is, is fixed. Okay, as a process called carbon fixation, where carbon can come from another uh, source and it can be turned into some other carbon compound. And carbon fixation is a big part of photosynthesis during the Calvin cycle. When the carbon dioxide comes in, you know, you got this series of enzymes that are responsible for taking that carbon and converting it into macromolecules that we can use to build sugars and other things. So here we're looking at a specific enzyme called Rubisco. And if you remember back in some of the old chapters, we know that enzymes oftentimes are sensitive to changes in temperature. They usually have optimum pH and temperature. And so we're looking at as we change the temperature for this environment that you can read about, pause and read about, does it affect how much carbon is going to be fixed? So key here during photosynthesis, just to highlight some key points, Rubisco, the enzyme, fixes atmospheric carbon into an organic molecule as one of the first steps of the Calvin cycle. And we need to explain why we see an increase between 25 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius. So if we draw our attention to the chart, this is 25 degrees to 40 degrees. And if you look at the uh, values there with a plus or minus um, two standard uh, error of the mean, that means that you can go in either direction um, accounting for that error, and even with accounting for the two uh, standard errors of the mean in either direction, we still see an overall increase in carbon fixation from 25 degrees Celsius to 40. Now you might say, oh my goodness, well I thought that increasing temperature can denature an enzyme. Well, that's only if we get outside the optimum range for the enzyme. And uh, because you can see an increase in enzyme enzymatic reaction when you increase temperature up until a set certain point. And then after that certain point is reached, then you can see a dive or a dramatic decrease in the enzyme's activity. But we're seeing an increase here, which indicates that, that our enzyme is not denatured. So then, hmm, what accounts for the increase? Well. An increase in temperature causes molecules to move faster. And when molecules move faster, there's a greater chance for this enzyme to come in contact with the substrate. So we're gonna have molecules moving faster. The enzyme will have a greater chance of colliding with the substrate and hence, we have a greater increase in the rate of carbon fixation. So that's actually a little bit of a tie back to some enzyme stuff and into some skills of explaining relationships here. Awesome. Let's continue. Topic 8.3, population ecology. So now we're looking at population growth. You might be familiar with things like, uh, you know, uh, logistic growth and, and exponential growth and the idea that population size can change as different factors in the environment changes. So let's go ahead and talk about some of these examples here. Our first one is exponential growth, that awesome J-shaped curve. And what that means is that when populations are small, you're not gonna see a lot of growth initially. Why is that? Because there's not many organisms. And so, you know, you gotta get the population going. And so with more reproduction, you start building more individuals in the population, then all of a sudden, bam, you can have this sharp increase in the reproductive rate. Hold on now, as long as there are, as, as long as there are enough resources to support that increase. So in many new populations or new environments where organisms first come in, 
as long as the conditions are ideal, then you can have them starting to reproduce. And then you can see this sharp increase in the number of organisms as a lot of reproduction is occurring because of under those ideal conditions conditions. And so seeing that sharp increase is that J-shaped curve, which is exponential growth. However, there are checks on the, on the growth of an organism, and we'll talk about that as well when we get to logistic growth. So how much a population actually increases largely depends upon availability of resources. So it should make sense. If food is less avail available, we don't expect the population size to be increasing. We expect it to decrease and vice versa. And that different organisms and different species have adaptations that can actually aid in their survival when energy availability changes. So maybe like the food, is not very um, abundant. And so you know you have organisms that might hibernate. They might hibernate during certain times of the year when food is not available. That's a way of conserving energy until resources are available. There are plants that do the same thing. They go dormant. Like uh, if you live in an environment where you have deciduous trees where the leaves drop off when it starts getting cold and the, um, the daylight hours begin to decrease, well, that's a way of conserving energy when their number one resource is not available or as, as available, which is sunlight. And so doing things like going into dormancy or migrating into other areas where resources are more abundant are some of the adaptations that organisms have to help them when energy avail availability um, changes in the environment. Taking a look at, look at another example, we just want to make sure here that we understand that if you belong to the same population, then you're going to more than likely interbreed with other, other individuals within your same proximity than you are with maybe organisms in other populations. So um, most of the times you see more of the interbreeding within a species within populations that are, are close to each other than you would populations that are further apart. All right, some misconceptions is that population growth is not limited. Population growth is limited. Exponential growth is like a hypothetical situation under ideal conditions, but there is a cap on populations, which we're going to talk about next. Organisms do not interact with their environment. No, no, no. Of course they do. Uh, we interact with our environment all the time, um, and that an increase in population size is only dependent on births. No, we have to calculate into that deaths as well. So changes in population size can be influenced by births. However, it can also be influenced by deaths. And depending upon uh, what population you're talking about, even migration can Im influence population size. All right, moving on to 8.4, density in populations. Um, here we're going to be talking about density dependent factors, density independent factors, jumping into lo logistic growth models that deals with capping those populations. They can't just grow forever. So let's jump into that conversation here and take a look at some examples. So density independent factors. Sometimes students get these words confused, like what does that actually mean to be density independent? What we're saying is that these are events in the environment that will, uh, you know, can devastate population size regardless of who's in the population, how many organisms are in the population, it doesn't matter. So if we have a forest fire like the one here, the forest fire is going to destroy the entire forest regardless of how many organisms are there. So you could have one deer in the forest or you can have a thousand deer in the forest. It doesn't matter because the devastation of the fire will have the same effect on the population regardless of the number of individuals in the population. So that's what we mean by density independent. The effect of this factor is not going to be dependent upon the number of organisms. So like our natural disasters, volcanic eruptions, pollution, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter if that there's, you know, three fox in the environment, foxes in the environment. If there is, if the water is polluted, then every fox that drinks the polluted water has the potential to die no matter how many um, foxes are in the population. So those are density independent factors. Uh, another example is density dependent. Now here we're dealing with something that 
will have a greater effect when the population size uh, is larger. So let's take instance for disease. Well, if we have this uh, particular disease that's spreading, maybe a mosquito is spreading a disease in the environment. Well, if the mosquito only has access to one individual and all the other individuals are maybe far away, then that one individual gets the disease, but because all the other members are spread out, then the likelihood that the disease is going to come in contact with the other individuals will be less likely than if the population was really dense, and density means proximity. So if all the organisms are living really, really closely with one another, then the, then the impact of that disease is going to be a lot greater. So it's going to be able to spread more quickly through the population because they're you know, more dense, more close to one another. Um, the same with uh, predation. If you're a lion and you come across a, um, a group of zebra and they're all you know, traveling in a herd and they're more closely dense, then my chances of maybe catching one of them is gonna be greater because I got a whole lot of them in one area as opposed to one zebra way over here and one way over here. And I gotta figure out which one I'm gonna chase down. Um, you know, so therefore these would be considered density dependent factors. Moving on to another example, um, density in populations. Uh, it says population density refers to how close, I've mentioned that before, and when there's abundance of food available, then we expect more reproduction. And if we get more reproduction, then we expect the population to get more dense, okay? More individuals going to be living in that population. When food is limited, we expect the density of the population to decrease, so we don't expect as much reproduction and the individuals will be more spread out um, in that population. All righty, so now here's our logistic growth curve, which is also referred to as an S-shaped curve. And if you look at that curve, like the first half of it, it looks just like the exponential growth curve. That's because oftentimes uh, populations start out with a bang, lots of reproduction, you get this great increase in population, but then you start seeing it level off. Why? Because there are limited resources and there's only a maximum number of individuals an environment can actually hold. And when you get to that maximum number, we call that K, the carrying capacity. So that little dotted line across that graph is representing the carrying capacity. And that's simply saying that this is the hypothetical amount of this particular uh, species or population that this environment can hold. Sometimes you'll see in some graphs where it looks like the, um, the, the population is fluctuating at the carrying capacity. It's slightly going above it, then it slightly goes down and slightly above. In climax communities, you can have that slight fluctuation at the carrying capacity where the population slightly exceeds, then something, you know, checks the population numbers and drops it back down below the carrying capacity, and then it goes back up. So you can see those slight fluctuations as well. Misconceptions. Populations cannot exceed carrying capacity. That's a misconception. I just told you that. Sometimes you do have small times in which the population size does slightly exceed the carrying capacity, but there will always be some kind of limiting factor that brings those numbers back down. When populations exceed carrying capacity, extinction will occur. That's a misconception. So just because we've slightly exceeded carrying capacity doesn't mean that the population is going to completely die out. Usually those limiting factors will bring the population back in check. All righty, let's look at some practice here. Some performing calculations. We have some formulas. Oh my goodness, some formulas. So this is our logistic growth formula. And so this is just, you know, making sure we know how to solve for variables. And so in this particular um, question, we're going to be solving for our max. So you can pause your video here if you want, read through there. Um, but I'm going to take you through the numbers you need to be paying attention to. So we're solving for our max. So the first number we're presented with in the formula is dn over dt, which is the logistic growth, and it's 225 in one year. So there's our value for that. 
Then we have 150 birds. That would be our in, which would be our population size. And then you see that there's a carrying capacity of 275 birds, which is our K. And if we use that handy dandy formula, looks like we already have our DN over DT, which is 225 in one year. Looks like we have our N value, which is 150. We have our K values, which is 275. And then we plug all that in there and we solve for the R max. So what is the logistic um, growth in the population increase, our R max will be 1.10. And there we're solving for the R max. Let's do another one. And this is an uh, actual uh, question that's out of your AP classroom. So this is a more of an AP like question using the calculation formula, same formula, logistic growth, we're solving for logistic growth here. Um, and what should we be pulling out? Well, they gave us our maximum growth rate, which is 0.28. So that's our R max. Here we have a population size of 3,652. Uh, 3, so that would be our population size, our N. And then it says we have a carrying capacity of 4,500. That's the maximum population. That's our K. And so it seems like we have all of our necessary numbers to solve for logistic growth. And we plug that into our values here and we come out with 193. However, we're not done because we're looking at the population size after one year. So once we do this formula here, we come up with 193, and that is how much the population grew in the one year, but then we have to add that to the population size that it started out when that year started. So the year started out at 3,652 bison. We did our handy dandy formula and we uh, saw that we had a logistic growth of 193 more individuals. So if we add that to our original starting size, then we end up with 3,845 bison in our population. All righty, moving on to our last topic is community ecology and making sure we understand that species do interact with other species. And when we have a group of different species interacting with one another, that is our community. Let's take a look at some examples here. Some terms we need to know, species diversity and species composition. Diversity is referring to how many different species do we have and how many individuals do we have of each of those species. Species composition refers to who do we have? Yes, we have different species, but who are they? And so this is where we're actually identifying the species. So species diversity, species composition are two important aspects that a, an ecologist would uh, be mindful of if they're looking at community ecology. So taking a look at this idea of species um, diversity, there's a formula on your AP formula sheet called the Simpsons Diversity Index. So, oh my goodness, how do we use that? Well, first thing we have to understand is when we talk about species diversity, there are two components of species diversity, something called richness and evenness. Richness is referring to how many different species are just there. How many different species do we have? Evenness is referring to the relative abundance. So taking a look at the example here for evenness, because sometimes students have more difficulty with that one. So evenness, let's say we have environment one that has three species. That's our richness. Our richness. We got three species. Then we have environment two that also has three species. So they got the same species richness. But let's take a look at how the, the individual species are spread out. If you notice that in environment one, it looks like we have the same number of individuals for each of the three species. But in environment two, we have only two of X, 82 of Y, 66 of species Z. And even though if we add up the total numbers of both of them, environment two actually has less evenness because of the way that they are distributed. So environment one, has more evenness across the three species. Environment two has less evenness across the three species, even though they both have three species and a total of 150 individuals. So this diversity index will have us looking at all of that when we do this calculation. And so here's just a random sample here. Um, and you have the species identified and you have there how you would plug that number in. Remember that sigma means the sum. So that means you got to keep repeating that calculation and then total all of that up. So what are we repeating? We're repeating the lowercase n divided by uppercase n squared. 
We're going to do that for each of the species, as you can see in the calculation. And once we do that, we're going to sum all those numbers together, and then we're going to subtract that number from one, and we're going to get a diversity index. And so there's the formula, and there is the diversity index based on my small example there. Now, in a real population ecology situation, you're going to collect a lot of samples. You're not just going to go out and collect one random sample and say, oh, my goodness, I have a lot of diversity in this environment from one sample. So a real population ecologist is going, or a community ecologist is going to take lots and lots and lots of samples and run those numbers through this diversity index. And so a number that's closer to one means you have more diversity. A number that's closer to zero means you have less diversity in the environment. So that's how you interpret that number there. All right, so let's take a look at symbiotic relationships. Um, do understand that we have some permanent relationships that occur in an environment and they're called symbioses and we have competition and pre predation that also represent community interactions. But here we're taking a look at some symbioses. And so there are three main symbiotic relationships, commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. And those plus and minuses and zeros represent, are we having an, a species benefit? Are we having both of them benefit? Are we having them benefit at the detriment of the other? And we're talking about an inter-species relationship. So these are permanent relationships between two different species. So here I have a picture of a lichen that I found um, out in my forest area. And a lichen is actually a symbiotic relationship. So if you look real close, you'll see those kind of light green patches on that piece of bark. And that is actually a fungal and alge an algal or fungal and cyanobacteria relationship. So you got this fungus living with this algae or the fungus is living with the uh, cyanobacteria. And in some cases, it may be all three of them living together in this mass that we call a lichen. And that is a mutualistic relationship because the fungus is getting benefit of all the good photosynthetic products that the algae and the cyanobacteria make. And then the fungal um, uh, components of the lichen is providing UV light protection. They like create this little shell that protects against UV light damage to the algae and the cyanobacterium. So that's an example of uh, a mutualistic relationship. So here we have predator-prey relationships, which are not mutualistic. And when you're looking at those interactions, you can see fluctuations. So as a predator population is increasing, we see that the prey population is decreasing. Guess why? Because they're eating the prey. But then we also see that as predator populations decrease, maybe because they suffer disease and they're dying off, then that gives the prey an opportunity to recover. And if you notice here, I'm pointing to the peaks on the graph that just to make sure we remember those trophic relationships because our Organisms that are on lower trophic levels, like in this case, the rabbit, would maintain an overall higher population size because of their 10% trophic relationship to the producers. And then the uh, higher consumers will maintain a lower relative population size. So just want to throw that in there as an additional thing to be mindful of. Misconceptions, symbiotic relationships are temporary. They're not, they're permanent. Predator-prey relationships are not symbiotic and cooperation is only between individuals of the same species. Eh, eh, eh. We can have co cooperation between organisms of different species. So taking a look at our practice here, our skills is statistical tests and analyses. Oh, error bars. So if you're looking at home, on demand, you can pause this and take a look at this, but this is making sure that you all know how to read those error bars. So which of the following is an accurate interpretation of this data based on the error bars? So letter A, no, because if you look at Richardson, sorry, Richard Sony, uh, which is the open bar, the one that's not shaded in, and you compare species four with species three, you see that those bars overlap. So that means that they are not significantly different from each other, okay? They're almost the same. They're the same uh, statistically, um, they are the same, okay? Because their error bars overlap. If we take a look at the next one that says the Coeli is significantly more frequent in species one than species two, once again, error bars overlap. That's the shaded bars. Looking at species one and two, you'll notice that they overlap. So there is no significant difference between them. 
If we take a look at the last one, letter D, significantly uh, more frequent. If you take a look at those bars, you can see that it's not so significantly more, but it's actually significantly less. And that's what rules that one out. So our answer would be letter C. And I just highlighted those there. These two are statistically the same. So we're gonna block them in as being the same, species three and four. These two are statistically, that's the word, the same. So we're gonna block those off as being the same. Now, if we compare three and four with one and two, we can see that they do not overlap. So therefore, R. Richardsoni is found to be significantly more frequent in species three, because it's higher than three and four, than species one and two, and their error bars do not overlap. So that means there is a statistical difference between the two. So hopefully that helps you with learning how to interpret those error bars. So content takeaways, oh my God, the takeaways is that the ecology, that the ecosystem is amazing and it's complex and there's lots of things going on and a lot of interaction actions and energy flow and all that stuff. We love the environment. And it's important to understand how growth and, and energy and all of those things are flowing constantly and matter throughout the ecosystem. Remember, use your AP Daily vid videos and progress checks. Practice those FRQs. Give us some feedback for the last time. I know, I know. <sighs> this is the last time we'll be with you for AP Live. Don't forget those important administration dates for your exams. Once again, this is Mrs. Evans, Margaret Evans, signing off from Woodbridge, Virginia, at Woodbridge Senior High School, home of the Mighty Mighty Vikings, thanking each and every one of you all. Thank you, Mr. Monsoor. Thank you, all the teachers out there. You guys are awesome. Somebody asked me to say shout out to their teacher for Teacher Appreciation Week. Well, I'm going to do one better. I'm a shout out to all teachers for Teacher Appreciation Week. And more importantly, we're shouting out to you because you had the courage to do this and take this class. And we are wishing you the best of luck. Be brave, stay strong, remember your knowledge, take a breath, and rock those AP exams. Margaret Evans, signing out.